Okay. My name is Brett Nelson from the Department of Emergency Medicine at Mount Sinai Hospital, and we're going to be speaking about uh, point of care ultrasound today, specifically looking at the kidney. Major questions that we think about for the kidney in terms of point of care ultrasound are going to be assessing for hydronephrosis and looking at bladder volume. So a lot of reasons why you would consider doing point of care uh, assessment of the kidney in a patient, flank pain, hematuria, uh, kidney patients with uh, acute renal failure, um, aneuria, or doing procedures. So let's, let's focus on the anatomy for a moment first. The uh, kidneys lay um, and the left and right flanks respectively connected by the ureter down to the bladder. The, um, the uh, bladder actually connects to the ureters um, down at the trigone of the bladder near the base of the bladder. In contrast to how it's typically drawn where you see it coming in from the top and this will become important uh, later on. So externally, um, we see there's Gerota's fascia around the outside of the kidney. The uh, cortex forms the area on the outer margin of the kidney. Inside, we see the uh, calyces within the uh, inner aspect, and that forms the inner uh, part of the collecting system in the kidney. And that goes into the renal pelvis, and then we see it go down into the ureter. Looks very similar on ultrasound, actually. We can see the um, Gerota's fascia here, this bright white area. We're in the right upper quadrant here. Another an, uh, anatomic uh, structure that we see in the right upper quadrant is the liver, uh, which uh, consists of the near field here. So outer cortex, inner medulla, and collecting system, and we can see some darker areas that are part of the collecting system here, part of the normal anatomy of the kidney. Here again, we see liver in the near field acting as a window for the acoustic energy. The next thing we see is this bright white Gerota's uh, fascia surrounding the kidney, outer cortex, inner medulla, collecting system, these dark areas here. So. Uh, we look at kidneys in two different planes. Typically, any structure we're going to image using ultrasound, we want to look at it in two different planes. So a longitudinal view of the kidney is ideally going to be through the largest area of the kidney that corresponds, that uh, contains the uh, superior pole as well as the inferior pole. I can tell this is the superior pole of the kidney because we're going to hold the probe with the probe marker up towards the patient's head. So anything on the uh, probe marker side of the screen is towards the patient's head. Anything on the other side is towards the patient's feet. So we want to image both kidneys in a longitudinal and transverse view, and then we want to image the bladder as well. The bladder sometimes is important to image on its own in the setting of, again, oliguria, anuria, uh, potential um, urinary uh, retention. We want to see if the bladder is empty or full. Um, you want to see if you've placed the Foley catheter and if it's not draining, if you actually see the Foley catheter within the bladder or if the bladder is emptied or not. Um, and, um, and also, if you do see some hydronephrosis that we'll talk about in a moment, you want to be able to assess whether this is hydronephrosis that's somewhat functional with respect to a, um, an obstruction caused by a very full uh, bladder. So that was a transverse view that we just saw. And notice that in a transverse view of the bladder, the bladder takes on a somewhat trapezoidal uh, shape or a square shape, depending on how full it is in the patient's exact anatomy. And typically behind it, we'll either see the vaginal cuff or the uterus or the prostate, depending if we're looking at a male or a female, when you have a transverse orientation. Sagittal orientation is very helpful because it gives us uh, a bit better lay of the land in terms of seeing a more triangular shaped bladder. And then above it, we'll typically see bowel, and behind it, we'll see bowel as well. And then occasionally, like in this patient, you can see a bit of prostate. If this was a female, we would see the uterus coming up through um, behind the bladder. So I've hinted a little bit at how we're going to do this. Um, we're going to start off in the longitudinal view. On the right side, we want to be somewhere around the mid-axillary line. We've got a bit of leeway between the anterior and the posterior axillary lines to scan through. You're going to be looking um, in between the ribs, and uh, just above the costal margin is often the most helpful place, and with the probe marker facing up towards the patient's head. The left kidney, in contrast, is going to be a bit more posterior, so we're going to hold the probe uh, uh, with the knuckles uh, of your hand touching the patient's bed, so you'll be a bit more posterior, and typically a little bit more towards the patient's head, your hand up higher towards the patient's head. And again, with the probe oriented up towards the patient's head, or a bit oblique with the probe angled a tiny bit towards the back of the bed. Uh, this places your beam of your probe more parallel to the ribs, and this way you get a, a more uh, ultrasound energy penetrating in between the ribs instead of being obscured by the ribs.
So again, longitudinal orientation, uh, very similar if you're familiar with doing a fast examination or an assessment for fluid in the right upper quadrant, we're going to see the liver, diaphragm, and longitudinal view of the kidney behind the liver. So here's an example of fanning anterior to posterior and a little bit superior and inferior. So this uh, sonographer here is really getting a full view of the kidney, superior pole, inferior pole, posterior, and anterior. So this gives us a good sense of what the entire uh, structure of the kidney looks like so we don't miss hydronephrosis, we don't miss fluid around the kidney either. Similarly, on the left side, the sonographer here is going from posterior to anterior and really fanning through the entire structure of the kidney. So in the transverse view, the liver, the kidney is going to look a bit more uh, round or oblong and not quite as long as it will in the longitudinal view. We still see the outer cortex, inner medulla, and a bit of the collecting system as it exits through the hilum of the kidney. So in order to get the bladder, we want to look at a transverse view and a longitudinal view. For the longitudinal view, pictured here on your screen left, we're going to have the probe marker oriented up towards the patient's head putting the probe right above the pubic symphysis. And a lot of people go too high up towards the navel. Right above the pubic symphysis is going to help us image the bladder when it's not quite as full, because it's really a pelvic organ. And then a transverse orientation you can see on your screen right, which is going to be oriented towards the patient's right-hand side, with the probe marker facing patient right. So here's a transverse view through the bladder. Again, it's a relatively full bladder, so we see this sort of characteristic square shape to it. Anterior wall here anechoic fluid throughout the entire bladder, and then the posterior wall down here. And what you'll see below here depends on which angle you're at. If you're very far inferior towards the patient's uh, um, back, you'll see the, um, the rectum or sigmoid colon back there. And if you're a little bit more towards the patient's head, you'll typically see uh, prostate in a man or vaginal cuff or uterus in a female. So we can look at a couple different dimensions here. Um, here again, this is a transverse view. So we have dimensions of anterior to posterior, and we have right, because the probe marker's on the right up here, right to left. If we turn the probe to a sagittal orientation, we still have anterior to posterior, but now we see um, inferior to superior. So you can actually use measurements here and have a look and see the bladder volume. And we'll talk about that in a bit more detail in a moment. So again, the primary thing we're looking for is hydronephrosis. And hydronephrosis is typically described um, in a variety of different ways, generally subjectively from grade one, which is almost no hydronephrosis at all, to grade five, where we see um, uh, the uh, renal architecture is entirely obscured by the uh, increasing size of the collecting system that's been dilated. So um, basically mild, moderate, and severe hydro, and somewhere along the spectrum is how we're going to typically describe it. And notice that the, the bear claw of the um, inner uh, shape of the collecting system basically dilates and spreads and, um, and obliterates the architecture in contrast to a cyst, for example. So here we see liver and kidney, as we've seen several slides in the past. We've got the cortex around the outside here and the medulla in the center. And the inner medulla architecture has been obliterated and spread apart here by this dilated collecting system, all this anechoic space in the center here. We see on a, a transverse view as well that the central collecting system has uh, significantly uh, dilated and pushed out the rest of the renal architecture. Another example here, outer view of the kidney and the inner collecting system here at the renal pelvis extending up into the calyces becoming very, very dilated. And yet again, another example here where the dilated collecting system. And, you know, in, in certain uh, scans through this uh, structure, it would almost look like there's a, a multi-cystic component to it. So typically, hydronephrosis is going to remain within the center of the kidney and push the, the rest of the architecture outwards. And here, that same kidney, through a transverse view, we can see this dilated collecting system and this almost horseshoe shape now of surrounding kidney.
So here's a real-time scan through a severely dilated kidney where the hydronephrosis has splayed out the architecture of the surrounding kidney pretty significantly. And you can trace really all of these back to the center and back to the hilum and back to the uh, collecting system. So in contrast to a polycystic kidney that's going to be a bunch of discrete cysts, all of these structures basically uh, coalesce into a single area that is very dilated ureter. So another couple of examples, just in case you're not sick of looking at these by now. So we've got hydronephrosis, and the next thing we uh, can talk about are stones briefly. We're not really looking for stones per se, but sometimes you can see them on ultrasound. So um, one of the more common areas that, the st uh, that a stone will get caught is at the uh, UVJ or the uteral vesicular junction. So we're in a sagittal orientation here. And this is towards the patient's head, this is towards their feet. So this is really sort of posterior here, and we see a stone right there measuring almost 8 millimeters. And it's hyperechoic, and it shadows a little bit, and it's right in the right spot, so that's pretty suspicious. In this particular patient, it was associated with hydronephrosis on the right side. So it really uh, was very consistent with the diagnosis of renal colic. The ureters themselves are very difficult to see on ultrasound, so typically the places you'll see stones, if you're going to find them, are going to be in the renal parenchyma itself, um, trapped in an area like the UVJ, or uh, floating around inside the bladder. So here again we see a stone in the renal parenchyma itself. And don't be mis misled by these. Clinically, um, a lot of people have these and are asymptomatic. So just be cautious if you're going to point to all your patient's symptoms being related to renal colic because they have a stone in their kidney. Uh, it may not be the stone in the kidney that's causing them to have any pain. And without any evidence to have a, a stone somewhere else, um, a broader differential should be considered. So here we see a transverse view through the bladder. And on the right-hand side here, so here's all this bladder, it's anechoic area, and on the right lower area near the trigone of the bladder we see again this bright white uh, hyperechoic structure and uh, that's again consistent with a kidney stone trapped at the UVJ. So we're seeing two things here when we throw a little Doppler on there. Uh, adding Doppler demonstrates a ureteral jet, which seems to be coming right out of that area. And some authors describe ureteral jets, which is basically the urine being squeezed out of the ureter um, into the bladder. So you can actually watch these streams come out. So that suggests that there's not a complete obstruction, because otherwise there wouldn't be any urine coming through that, ure uh, that ureter on the affected side. And the other thing we're seeing is a little speckling behind the stone itself. And there's one or two articles in the ultrasound literature that suggest that that's a reasonably sensitive and specific sign um, of stones and that stones tend to speckle on ultrasound. And it's not really 100% clear why that is. It might have something to do with the rough texture of the stone itself and the way it interferes with the uh, reflections of the Doppler signal. So two signals here uh, that you're looking in the right spot, meaning the UVJ, because there's a jet coming out of there, and that this hypoechoic area with some speckling is likely to be a stone. This stuff is a little bit more complicated. Again, we're typically going to make a diagnosis of stones in the right clinical environment without many other dangerous things in the differential besides renal colic in a patient with a pretty typical presentation who has hydronephrosis on the affected side. So again, hydro is the main thing we're looking for, but again, you can see a bit of uh, evidence of stones. So I mentioned bladder volume before. Let's talk about that in a bit more detail. Um, we can get a rough sense of bladder volume if your question is just, does the bladder look big or small? So someone who tells you that they haven't been able to urinate for 12 hours and you look at their bladder and it looks gigantic, well, then they have an obstruction. And if they have no urine in their bladder or you can't find their bladder, then they're aneuric for some reason. So that's a pretty big decision point right there. Um, there's some uh, literature on using bladder volume for something very straightforward like procedures. Now, you may be thinking of uh, bladder catheterization in terms of a suprapubic aspiration, and that's certainly possible. It's becoming, I think, a bit more of a rare uh, procedure that that's needed to do um, at this point, but, um, or, or at least just to be able to get urine where you couldn't otherwise get it. But uh, urine catheterization can be aided by ultrasound guidance, mainly by making sure that you don't have a dry tap. So assess the patient's bladder volume before attempting uh, insertion of a straight catheter or a Foley catheter. And if they don't have uh, enough volume in their bladder, you can save them, especially in a pediatric population when you're uh, looking to do a, uh, a urinalysis and you need to do a catheterization, you can save that dry tap. So um, here in this one article by, uh, in the journal Pediatrics, for example, 72% success rate by just 
sort of blindly uh, placing a straight cath into uh, an infant, and a 96% success rate when ultrasound was used. So in about a quarter of the cases, the authors found that there was not enough uh, urine in the bladder to have an attempt, so they would have the child nurse or take a bottle or something and uh, try again later, and that saves the patient and the, and the caregivers and the parents certainly a lot of anxiety, and, uh, and it's a fairly straightforward thing to do. So here they were using a, um, uh, an ultrasound uh, machine to demonstrate length, width, and height of the uh, bladder, and they basically looked for, um, uh, to, to make sure there was sufficient volume to, uh, to do a catheterization. Yeah, most machines are capable of doing these, and they can have the equations sort of built in. As we mentioned before, in this, trans, in this, uh, in this view here, we have uh, anterior, uh, posterior, and um, uh, this is actually left and right. It's mislabeled as sagittal. This is a transverse view. And then here in the uh, sagittal view, um, you know, the, the bladder extends off the edges of the screen, so it is at least uh, 14 centimeters at this point, giving a total bladder volume here of almost a liter, or probably at least a liter again, because it's larger than the measurements there. So again, if your machine is capable of doing measurements, uh, you can look to the calculations area and measure that. Or you can remember a pretty simple equation that's been validated by several studies. Uh, take the volume of a cube and take 3 quarters of it. So length times width times height of the bladder uh, times 0.75. So again, 3 quarters of a cube will give you a good sense of the bladder volume. So in a couple ways you can use this. You can make sure that you're not doing dry taps, and that's very helpful. You can assess a person for having a large bladder or small bladder in the setting of uh, difficulty in passing urine. And, um, and you can also use it to do a non-invasive post-void residual. So instead of having the patient urinate and then catheterizing them and measuring the output, you can have the patient urinate and then measure their bladder volume. Uh, and again, you can assess, you know, basic stuff, binary stuff, like is it greater or less than 150 cc's, or you can get, you know, reasonably accurate. So if you need a down to the cc measurement, you'll probably need to put a catheter in them. But if you just want to get a sense if they're fully emptying their bladder or not within reason, you can use these non-invasive assessments, again, which are simple, uh, use less resources, and certainly the patients typically thank you for that. So I mentioned earlier that we can look at the bladder even when it's relatively empty by placing the probe right on top of the pubic symphysis and then angling down into the pelvis. And occasionally you can see things like this structure here, which is a circular structure. And this is a Foley catheter balloon. So yeah, you can assess that the Foley catheter is patent or not, but you can also use this to just demonstrate for yourself that I'm actually visualizing the bladder and I have the skills that I can actually see it even when it's relatively empty. So this bladder was, was empty. Sometimes a Foley catheter is in place and you see a very large bladder surrounding it and then you know that there's a malfunction or a mechanical problem with the Foley catheter. So in your travels looking at the kidneys, you may see some other structures. Uh, we already mentioned hydronephrosis and stones, but a very common thing that you'll see are cysts. So just a picture to demonstrate how much prettier things look on ultrasound. For some reason, this image of real life cysts on this cadaveric kidney uh, looks a lot grosser than the black and white images you normally see on the ultrasound screen. So this, probably a much bigger cyst. God knows what this thing would look like on a path table, but uh, on ultrasound, it just looks kind of neat. There are these large, relatively spherical, anechoic structures, um, one especially prominent at the superior pole of the kidney, and then there is another one sort of uh, mid-kidney uh, mid there. So um, in contrast to the um, uh, hydronephrosis that, dis that splays out the rest of the architecture of the kidney and really uh, pushes it outwards and, and uh, ruins the underlying parenchyma, uh, cysts almost look like someone took a cookie cutter to the kidney and punch out particular holes in it. So um, cysts are a very common thing that you'll see. They shouldn't have flow within them, and uh, sonographers tend to characterize these as whether they have echoes within them or not probably beyond the scope of a point-of-care ultrasound where you're essentially just trying to assess for hydronephrosis, but certainly when you see abnormalities like cysts or other problems, you should make a note of it and consider uh, further imaging um, from uh, radiology. So here's another example of a very large cyst. The rest of the kidney looks perfectly happy. There just happens to be this large cyst at the superior pole. So they'll typically have smooth, clean walls, and you can often confuse the, the, para, the renal pyramids for cysts. Um, cysts are going to be, again, relatively um, uh, circular in shape, spherical if you go through all three dimensions, and the pyramids are going to taper down towards the center of the kidney. So a couple more examples of cysts. 
And here we have so many cysts that it actually uh, it, it disproves the rule that I was just mentioning that the cysts don't bother the rest of the renal parenchyma. With polycystic kidney disease, there are just so many cysts that they, they do um, uh, displace a lot of the rest of the renal parenchyma. So this is a very important finding if you notice it um, because uh, obviously this has implications for renal function. So uh, careful note should be made of um, polycystic kidney disease and whatever follow-up is necessary should be arranged for the patient. Occasionally, you'll see a kidney that looks relatively normal in terms of its structure, um, but it uh, is relatively hyperechoic. Uh, most of the kidneys that you've noticed so far during this talk are, are isoechoic, or probably more accurately, they're a bit hypoechoic. They're a bit darker than the liver or the spleen that they're next to. So there's a bit of a litmus test right next to each kidney and something you can compare it to. So um, when you see a brighter than usual kidney, it's typically a sign of acute uh, renal failure, or you can see it with chronic kidney disease as well. So um, here we see, for example, uh, a kidney in a patient who's, uh, per, uh, who's a uh, renal dialysis patient. So there is a um, uh, a uh, smaller and very an a hypo hyperechoic uh, kidney. So tiny, bright kidneys are very commonly found in patients with renal failure. There's another example there in comparing how bright this is to the relatively darker liver above it. So again, the primary things we're looking for with kidney ultrasound are hydronephrosis, and uh, that's going to give us a clue that the patient may have uh, an obstruction, such as renal colic. And we want to look at the bladder size, because that's going to help with an enormous number of things like procedures, guiding uh, Foley catheter placement or straight catheterization, or whether it's appropriate to do so in that patient, whether they have a distal obstruction or not, and uh, assessing things like post-void residual as well. There are more tutorials on this and other topics tips and tricks, and uh, lots of blog posts on our website, sinaiem.us. So please uh, email us uh, using the contact form in that location with questions, comments, and uh, ideas for other things that we can teach you. Thanks so much.